And you can see why that might happen, because that's someone at the pinnacle of a very steep hierarchy who has a tremendous amount of power and influence. But the Christian response to that was, never confuse the specific sovereign with the principle of sovereignty itself. It's brilliant. It's, you see how difficult it is to come up with an idea like that, so that even the person who has the power is actually subordinate to something else. Subordinate to, uh, let's call it a divine principle, for lack of a better word. So that even the king himself is subordinate to the principle. And we still believe that because we believe that our president, our prime minister, is subordinate to the damn law. Whatever the body of law, right? There's a principle inside that that even the leader is subordinate to. And without that, you could argue you can't even have a civilized society because your, your leader immediately turns into something that's transcendent and all-powerful. And I mean, that's certainly what happened in the Soviet Union and what happened in Maoist China and what happened in Nazi Germany because there was nothing for the powerful to subordinate themselves to. You're supposed to be subordinate to God. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to tear that idea apart, but partly what it means is that you're subordinate even if you're sovereign to the principle of sovereignty itself. And then the question is, what the hell is the principle of sovereignty? And I could say, we have been working that out for a very long period of time. And so that's one of the things that we'll talk about, because the ancient Mesopotamians and the ancient Egyptians had some very interesting, dramatic ideas about that. So, just for example, very briefly, there was a, a deity known as Marduk. And Marduk, he was a Mesopotamian deity, and... Imagine this is sort of what happened, is that as an empire grew out of the post-Ice Age age, say 15,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, all these tribes came together, and these tribes each had their own deity, their own image of the ideal, but then they started to occupy the same territory, right? And so then one tribe had God A, and one tribe had God B, and you know, they, one could wipe the other one out, and then it would just be God A who wins, but that's not so good, because... Well, maybe you want to trade with those people, or maybe you don't want to lose half your population in a war, something like that. So then you have to have an argument about whose god is going to take priority, which ideal is going to take priority. And what seems to happen is that's represented in mythology as a battle of the gods in sort of celestial space. But from a practical perspective, it's more like an ongoing dialogue. You believe this, I believe this. You believe that, I believe this. How are we going to meld that together? So you take god... A and you take God B and maybe what you do is extract God C from them and you say well God C now has the attributes of A and B and then some other tribes come in and then C takes them over too and so you get like with Marduk for example he has a multitude of names 50 different names well those are names at least in part of the subordinate gods that represented the tribes that came together to make the civilization that's part of the process by which that abstracted ideal is abstracted you think this is important, and it works because your tribe's alive. And you think this is important, and it works because your tribe is alive. And so we'll take the best of both if we can manage it and ex extract out something that's even more abstract that covers both of us if we can do it. And one of the things that's really interesting about Marduk, I'll just give you a couple of, of his features, but he has eyes all the way around his head. He's elected by all the other gods to be king god. So that's the first thing. That's quite cool. And they elect him because they're... They're facing a terrible threat, sort of like a flood and a monster combined, something like that. And Marduk basically says that if they elect him top god, then he'll go out and stop the flood monster and, and, and they won't all get wiped out. It's a serious threat. It's chaos itself making its comeback. And so all the gods agree. And Marduk is a new manifestation. He's got eyes all the way around his head and he speaks magic words. And then he also goes out and when he fights, he fights this deity called Tiamat. And, and we need to know that because the word Tiamat is associated with the word Tehom, T-E-H-O-M. And Tehom is the chaos that God makes order out of at the beginning of time in Genesis. So it's linked very tightly to this story. And Marduk, with his eyes and his capacity to speak magic words, goes out to confront Tiamat, who's like a watery sea dragon, something like that. Uh, it's a classic, it's a classic St. George story to go out and... and wreak havoc on the dragon, and he cuts her into pieces, and he makes the world out of her pieces, and that's the world that human beings live in, and the Mesopotamian emperor acted out Marduk. He was allowed to be emperor insofar as he was a good Marduk, and so 
That meant that he had eyes all the way around his head and he could speak magic. He could speak properly. And so that we're starting to understand there at that point the essence of leadership, right? Because what's leadership? It's the capacity to see what the hell's in front of your face and maybe in every direction. And then the capacity to use your language properly in a transformative manner and to transform chaos into order. And God only know how, knows how long it took the Mesopotamians to figure that out. And the best they could do is dramatize it. But it's staggeringly brilliant. You know, it's, it's by no means obvious. And this chaos, this chaos is a very strange thing. And this is the chaos that God wrestled with at the beginning of time. Chaos is what, it, it's half psychological and half real. There's no other way to really describe it. The chaos is what you encounter when you're thrown into deep confusion. Right? When your world falls apart, when, when you encounter something that blows you into pieces, when your dreams die, when you're betrayed, it's the chaos that emerges. And the chaos is everything at once, and it's too much for you. And that's for sure. And it pulls you down into the underworld. And all, that's where the dragons are. And all you've got at that point is your capacity to bloody well keep your eyes open and to speak 